Welcome everybody to the meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee for the South, Shore, South Yorkshire Mayor Combined Authority. I'll say it out loud once. Um, um, so welcome to everybody. And uh, we've had apologies from Councillor Jake Kersley and Councillor Jane Kidd so far. And we've got an additional apology, have we? For taxi job last night. Um, right, uh, so we'll swiftly move on to item two. Are there any urgent items or announcements? There are none. Okay. Item three, items to be considered in the absence of press and public. There are none that I am aware of. Nope. nope. Okay. Uh, quickly moving on to declaration of interest by any members. Uh, do any members have any declarations of interest pertaining to any items on the in the meeting today. Nope. I'm, I'm truly going to give you um, a proper clap apology if you've got a set of papers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to sit for you. You get 50 papers. <laughs> And uh, reports from and questions by members. We haven't got any for that. So moving on to agenda item six. Questions from members of the public. We have none. I understand this is a regular occurrence throughout the country on Mayor Provider Authority so far. But we'll say next year. I know, next year. I'm sure we will. Look forward to it. Right, uh, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 14th of December and matters of revising and review of Agden log. Are members content that the minutes are an accurate record of the meeting held on the 14th of December? Okay. Um, please note updates are o on open and closed actions given in the log. On the tram mobilisation action number 116, we will receive a verbal update from Tim Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so, um, members will recall this is a question particularly around management of the uh, road surface and the, um, the, the, the tramway um, more generally. Um, so, just for members' awareness, the current responsibility for maintenance of the track slab and the road surface between the rails and 18 inches either side of the outside rails. Is currently uh, undertaken by uh, Stage Coach Super Tram um, and Sheffield City Council responsible for the rest of the road surface uh, remaining. Um, so, as members also hopefully are aware, that the own, uh, ownership and management um, changes uh, on the morning of the 22nd of March, and that will transfer to South Yorkshire Future Trams Limited from that date onwards, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Combined Authority. Um, so, we, we recognise that clearly the track slab does need constant maintenance, ongoing maintenance. The MCA has invested in some digital technology which allows us to better monitor that and understand in terms of where those concerns and, and issues are, out, uh, are, are raised. Um, there is an ongoing maintenance programme which is part of the ordinary maintenance programme of the network and the system as a whole. And obviously we, we have teams that go out, and the Supertram currently have teams that go out on a daily basis to inspect and, and fill those gaps. Um, we're happy to have members of the public and members of this committee uh, tell us of any particular areas of concern. I think it was originally raised off some issues in the Hillsborough area. Um, so, you know, we're happy to get teams to go out and look at specific <coughs> problem points going forward, and clearly that will be the responsibility of South Yorkshire Future Super Trans Limited, i.e. the Combined Authority, from the 22nd onwards. So happy to take your questions on that point, Chair. I was going to ask, um, I hope you're not going to take as long to fix a broken tram rail as appears to have happened recently and what actions and measures you've got in place so that, that doesn't close the tram network or part of the network for so long. But I don't know whether it's for you or for them. I, I can uh, answer that question as, as best I can, Chair, if that's okay. So um, I think you're talking about the one up at Manor Top a few weeks ago. Um, so that was identified on the Tuesday, I forget the precise date. Um, uh, it was lunchtime on the Tuesday. So the network was closed with immediate effect for safety reasons. And again, this is a closure purely for safety. I have to emphasize that that's why we don't run trams over broken rails. This was in fact a double break, so it was two very adjacent breaks either side of a, a weld. Um, in order to do the work, you need specialist contractors. If it's on ballasted section, you can do it, i.e. You know, where the bits of the rails are above the ballast, that's very easy to repair, that's typically an overnight job. For ballast embedded, uh, for embedded rails, so the 
put it in the concrete in the road surface, that does require, as I say, specialist contractors. We engage with them um, immediately to check for their availability. Um, those contractors were not available until the following week. Uh, we therefore put in place emergency bus provision, which started on the first service on the Thursday morning and ran through to the following close of place Thursday, the following week. So there was a bus replacement service with match frequency with immediate effect. Clearly, it took a week for us to get the contractors in. They started work on uh, the following Tuesday evening, uh, and it was three nights worth of work to do the work before we repaired the rail. Um, so we have call-off contracts in place uh, now and going forward under the new ownership or the, the new management arrangement, should I say. Um, and obviously, it very much depends on the circumstances of where that break occurs. It's also worth noting that only certain points on the network that trams can turn. So you, you might think, well, why couldn't the tram all go all the way up to the stop before you can only do it you've got crossover facilities and the furthest crossover facility before the break was at the station so that's why often you'll see when the breaks occur people turn up um Hillsborough, um places like cathedral places like the station so it's an ongoing part of owning a tram system it's a function a feature of having a tram system and we've got a program of rail replacement we're going to go on to this summer as well to make sure we minimize the likelihood of future breaks I'll stop there, but happy to take further questions, Jeff. I've got a question from Douglas. Thanks, yeah. Uh, so specific as, uh, on the Hillsborough thing, did you say that actually has been inspected? Yeah. Like a report, that has been done. That has yeah. been inspected. I can double check whether or not the actual work's been undertaken. Yeah. Certainly will have had an inspection since, um, since the issue was raised in the last meeting. I, th I thought that would be the case, but thanks for doing that. And then the second question is about um, the division of work between uh, Supertram and Highways England. Um, are we... Sh is Highways England pulling their weight in doing the uh, amount of work they should be? I mean, uh, can you describe how the division is split up? And how do we know that they're pulling their weight? So I don't think it is a Highways England issue. It okay. is a Highway Authority issue, and the Highway Authority is Sheffield City Council. So Sheffield City Council are responsible for the bit beyond 18 inches outside of the further, uh, furthest outside rail. Sorry, should, where it says Highways England, should that be the Highways Authority? Yeah, it probably should be the Highways Authority. Okay, well, that's a different yeah. thing, isn't yeah. it? Okay, that's just wrong. All right, thanks. That explains that then. Any more questions on this? Josh? Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I've got a quick question. Could, could, you, could you just confirm then that going forward, if there's an issue, like we've, we've seen previously in that area in trams, that it won't take a week just for the contractors to come out? Because that's, that's a joke, isn't it? Having to wait a week just for a contractor to come out. I, personally, I don't think it is a joke. I think we want to make sure we get contractors who are competent and safe in doing the work necessary. There are so, only so many of those contractors in the country. It's a very specialist um, skill set and role. We've got call-off contracts in place with those specialists ready to do the work. It just so happened that when that break occurred, they were actually already committed to some work in Croydon on the tram system, as I understand it. So the earliest they could release resources to come to us to do our work was the following Tuesday. Now, clearly, we don't want rail breaks to occur. We want to make sure that uh, the network doesn't suffer these issues because it creates lost revenue and incurs cost to us. But you know, as soon as we can get safe, competent people to do the work, we'll do so, and we'll make sure that it gets done as quickly as possible, reopen the system as soon as possible. But certainly, you know, I'm not going to give a guarantee here that it will never take potentially a week to do that kind of work again in future. Right. Shall so we move? Are you, are you happy? Or yeah, I just wonder if I could ask, ask another question on that. So do you, do, you, do you have a backup contractor then? You know, so, so you're not having to rely on one contractor? Yeah, but find me contractor to do this work at the moment. That's, that's what the call of contracts. And again, happy to share it. I'm not going to list the names off at the moment. I, we can give, as part of the minutes, a list of the contractors that we've secured through the call-off arrangement that are in place now. Okay, so, so since that there is more, more than one contractor then that will... That, that, that's available. There are different contractors involved with again. different parts of the process, so it very much depends on the nature of the work that's required in terms of doing it. But there's a primary contractor, Volker Rail, who do the embedded rail replacement work, and they're the primary contractor that we do to do this work. But we have a wider call-off contract to do track replacement work for other parts of the process as well. Right, okay. I, I, just, I just find it completely bizarre that you've got to wait a week for a contractor to, to, fix, to fix an issue like that. I, I, I understand, you know, you, they don't just grow off trees, but you, you would have thought that, you know, th the combined authority, the authorities would have had foresight or something like this, so people aren't waiting a week just for contractors to come out. Thank you for that, Josh. Um, we're going to move on now to um, welcome to Mayor Oliver Coppard. Oliver, uh, welcome today. Um, Chair, sorry, did you want a very brief update on the other action on community transport? No, 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 no,
So, uh, yeah, so um, just, I'll, sorry, Oliver. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> it, I, I don't know, I thought we could have a... Did you want to, you got a time got limit? I've got another appointment after this, sir. Yeah, no, you I go. Know. So we've got other notes on the, on the paper for this, so I thought we'd come through, so it was just what we were relating fine, to Jeff. for these yeah, actions. We'll fine. come back to you. Don't you worry. <laughs> Welcome again. Um, you provided us with a short update on the most significant areas of the work you've been doing since we last met in December. So we'll proceed straight to the questions. Questions, please, from members. Should we do like that again? Um, although it's already on our agenda, Oliver, I did want to ask more about the Safe Place to Sleep programme. Um, it's not quite as big a scheme as Finland, <laughs> or even Scotland, but it's a good start. Um, I just wanted to ask more about how you're going to how it's going to progress because um, it sort of says Moses basket and that's three months and then you're back for a cot and then you're back for a cot bed and then you're back for a bed. Is there any way of, I don't know, starting out with a cot or, and what do you do in between with, do people bring things back to baby basics or whatever? Um, and if you have got a baby that's now moved into a cot, but you have a new baby, do you get a new Moses basket or do you recycle it? Um, and are you planning to expand it to anything more than just beds? Um, I don't know. Not just and bedding, but also clothing and such like. There you go. Thank you. And thank you for asking, because I'm really proud to talk about it. Um, 2.2 million pound scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. 2.2 uh, million pound scheme. Um, which guarantees a bed for every under five in South Yorkshire. And, and I think that's really an important point, um, is that throughout that journey, and there are a bunch of families who will need support throughout that journey, sadly, um, we will be there to kind of wrap our arms around them and give them that, that support. It's probably also important to say that we're delivering that not ourselves, as you'd expect. You know, we are not a, a, a baby uh, bed delivery organisation, but we are working with, uh, we're working with, we've got vision for our empire, but it's not quite that far. Um, we are absolutely um, working with Baby Basics to deliver on that, and they are then stepping in, so they won't just offer a Moses basket, Baby Basics, if you need more help, will offer more help. So that's one of the benefits, I think, of working in an organisation like theirs, as much as we're focusing on that bed, there is then an opportunity to kind of get a wider intervention in, into that place. I don't know the specific answer to your questions about the different kind of like transition points in the process, but I'm happy to try and get an answer for you from Baby Basics. If we could take a note, please, and get Sean a, a response. Um, I think just important also to say, because you point out um, the experience of Finland and, and Scotland, and we'd love to be able to kind of do more of a kind of wraparound support more broadly across South Yorkshire, but in Rotherham, um, through the work of Chris Reed, the brilliant work that they've done out there, they're also now putting in place a, um, a, a baby pack um, that they've now agreed through their budget process. And I went to see that yesterday at one of their children's centres, and it's brilliant, it's lovely, it's all the things you'd expect from that bigger, wider intervention. That's a universal offer. And so what I was talking to them about yesterday was the fact that we've now solved the bed problem for families. We're equally solving the baby pack challenge for families in Rotherham. Um, and so kind of in some parts of South Yorkshire, there is more of that kind of absolute wraparound support. And in four wards across South Yorkshire, Swinton, Metzborough, Goldthorpe, and one other, um, we are also um, uh, we are also putting in a much more kind of uh, we're putting in, in place a more wraparound support as well, and that will all lead to kind of in, insight that we get at the end of this process that helps to make the case for more investment in hopefully a bigger and deeper and wider and longer term uh, intervention. Can can I just make? Follow up from something that I was going to ask, okay. uh, Oliver. Uh, with the, the Rotherham, is, is it Rotherham Council that are rolling that out, that are doing that? And That's right, yeah. are you going to coordinate with the other councils within the authority to see whether that can be spread? Uh, we obviously, with any modifications that may be needed, because obviously nothing's perfect first time, uh, to the other councils, can you assure us that that, may, that, that will happen? 
so it's, it's the, the baby packs are not mine so I can't you, you, indeed indeed so I, I think I mean we work collectively across South Yorkshire and, and just to give a bit of kind of background to how this whole thing started and where it came from so I'm part of the Harvard City Leadership um, initiative Harvard Bloomberg City Leadership initiative like a global collection of mayors who are working together to solve big and complex problems with the support of Harvard University and Bloomberg philanthropies and this piece of work in particular came about as a result of the partnership working that they helped us to foster across South Yorkshire. I know that might sound strange that we brought in Bloomberg and Harvard to help us in South Yorkshire, but there are some really complex and tricky problems that we're trying to solve that, as you can imagine, different parts of the system want to approach in different ways. And so we found um, a point, in, an intervention point that everybody could agree on, frankly, which was beds for babies. And through work that's been led through this organization, brilliant office called Andy Gates, we've been able to kind of then take that work forward in this specific instance. And the whole point of that process, if you hear from Harvard and Bloomberg, is that we then kind of go further and we go wider. So you, once you find your way in, you then try and do more. So I'd love to have that conversation with our councils. That said, there is a significant cost to the baby pack and other councils would have to kind of work out how to pay for that. One of the things that I ask, and I um, don't know whether Mr. Nudd's thought of the next question, but what I was going to say is what sort of numbers of the different types of beds from the Moses basket upwards do you feel that, you, that, 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 you're gonna, that, that are likely to be provided? They don't have to give us numbers now, but if you've got a ballpark of what you think that may be needed, because that's, that's the sort of... That we that we'll be looking at. I mean, I'm not expecting to have the numbers now, but it'd be nice to know what sort of what we're looking at in South York, across South Yorkshire, um, as having to provide uh, looking. So, so from memory, from memory, I think I, I seem to remember there was a, f a figure of 14,000 families that we thought might need that sort of intervention or support. That might be wrong, so let me confirm that and, and write to you. That said, the 2.2 million pounds is not just for beds. We're working in partnership with IKEA who are providing some support. We're clearly working in partnership with all our local authorities and Baby Basics. It's also for that wider wraparound intervention, an officer in our organization to make sure that is all coordinated and that we're learning the lessons that we need to and that the pilots are absolutely giving us the information that we want to be able to make the case going forward for the program. So that investment is not just sort of 2.2 million divided, for instance, by 14,000. It's actually kind of a wider wraparound kind of project in order to help those families in whatever way we can. And, and that's why I'm so proud of it, really, because it's not just a bed. It's absolutely thinking more broadly about the system that we want to influence, about using this as a jumping off point, I hope, to show that collectively working together, we can solve some of those big problems. And absolutely learning, and I'm pointing towards Josh as though he's the person respo the, the responsible, uh, uh, Rotherham, but like the R Rotherham example, if you want to take credit, you can. The Rotherham example, I think, is a, is a really good one of kind of, there are, are places in South Yorkshire that are doing brilliant things where they are, we should try and learn from them and, and, and build them out across the rest of South Yorkshire. Thank you for that. Uh, Sean, over. Yeah, <coughs> there were three things. Sorry, Oliver. Right. Um, one, can we have a book with every bed? Go on. As a, as a former employee of Book Trust, I would very much hope that books were already taken care of with all of those families because they should all universally be gifted a book in the first year of life, uh, age two, and then before age five. They should all get that access as well as other uh, access through things like um, uh, treasure packs, etc. They should get that access anyway. So I would hope that the books, the books are in the, um, the baby packs that Rotherham are gifting. Um, so in Rotherham, that problem is solved. I would hope absolutely that across the rest of South Yorkshire, and I know in Sheffield in particular, there is a brilliant book gifting service uh, led by Book Trust and through Health Visitors, etc., and the Library Service. So I would hope that problem has already been solved. I'm happy to get into that conversation because, as you know, that would be something I would kind of love to do more of. And we at one point had more funding for Book Trust, but we are where we are. Um, I quite like books too. Um, <laughs> no, I, I know. I'm very reticent. Um, you said that Baby Basics are, are being your partner. And I know Baby, Baby Basics is based in Sheffield. Is there a Baby Basics in the other boroughs? Baby Basics, uh, they're a national charity based in Sheffield, so they work across South Yorkshire. Oh. Um, so they've got access to, uh, to points across South Yorkshire, so, so they, they are very happy to work across. And as you know, you know, we've got Jessops here who don't just have babies from Sheffield, and you know, et cetera, so they're, they're, they are working right across the system. 
um, and actually through this piece of work have been able to develop those relationships more strongly in other local authorities. So the whole point of this work, as much as the focal point has been beds for babies, the whole point of the work is to develop those partnerships, integrate more effectively the voluntary sector, all the different local authorities, the NHS, around a specific project and then build that out. So yeah, Baby Basics have used this project as a way to reinforce some of those relationships, albeit they were already in those local authorities as well. Finally, sorry, um, I was on the fire authority when Barnsley developed uh, temperature cards for parents to take out with them when their child left hospital, which was about the temperature your child ought to sleep at, <coughs> dangerous temperatures and things in your house. Um, and again, because that's about the sleeping thing, can we, I don't know whether the fire authority is still doing it with Barnsley, uh, and it's the Barnsley Hospital, obviously. But if they are, can we try and do some linking there as well? So we'll, we'll take a note and I, and I will write a letter. Uh, uh, well, maybe we'll do a bit of work just before, just to check we're not putting people in awkward positions. But if we are in that position where we can kind of connect people up, I'll connect up Chris Kirby with uh, Baby Basics and see if they can't broker that conversation in themselves about how to do that. Thank you, Douglas. Um, thanks, yeah, it's all good ideas. I mean, Obviously, that to be slightly flippant, 2.2 million is a lot to spend on Moses baskets. Um, so I appreciate it. it's a much wider thing there. What I just really want to ask you is structure about the sort of uh, duplication, because these are roles you don't expect each of the four local authorities to be doing. And like you said, you know, Rotherham's well ahead with it. You know, I think there are some people in Sheffield doing this sort of work. Um, how, how does it all fit together in terms of you know the well the risk of duplication really? Um, so, of course, there are people across all the local authorities, not least the DPS in each local authority who is working on these sorts of issues. The, the challenge is obviously resourcing in some, to, to a certain extent, and that's why we've stepped in to support with that investment because of the resource we have here. Um, and I appreciate local authorities have got all sorts of calls on their budget, so where we can, we will help. Um, I, I think f from that point on, it then becomes about kind of where can we plug gaps, really, because essentially, you know, we have kind of tried to find the most effective space for us to intervene and you know the advice that we got from the people who were kind of leading that project from right across South Yorkshire and they were all involved in one way shape or form uh, meant that actually that was the choice that we made was was beds for babies as the as the most effective intervention as the starting point so from here on really it is about working through that project and as I say across those those teams to make sure that we are learning the lessons from places like Rotherham where they're doing really good things, learning where Sheffield is doing really well and there are examples absolutely of Sheffield doing really good stuff so kind of making sure that actually through that system, through that model, through that approach that those people are talking and that's what we're finding. So you'll know Sally Pierce from Sheffield Hallam University who's brilliant and runs the nursery up at Shirecliff and now she's working with colleagues over in Doncaster for instance and helping them to understand what interventions she's put in place through her work at Hallam. You know, so that's how this project is working to really help those bits of best practice right across the system to infiltrate and, um, and then impregnate the rest of the, the system across South Yorkshire. That, that's helpful as well. Uh, I suppose the point is though that I was saying that really this is running in parallel to whatever you know, our children's services and um, family services uh, staff are doing in Sheffield. Or, or does this have a link with you know, a, say a named officer within Sheffield Council and the other three councils involved? Yes, um, absolutely. This who would be the Sheffield right. person? So we'll get you the name assume of the it's not the DCS. No. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think that's something that can you provide that? Can, to we can write. To, we can write to you. But no, the yeah. point is absolutely that it is about it, it is about working with our local authority partners. This is not just my scheme. As much as I was the person on yeah. the photo, Tom was there yesterday, yeah. kind of helping us to launch it. This is a scheme right across South Yorkshire, owned by the local authorities, the voluntary sector, universities, private sector, philanthropy, Harvard University, Bloomberg and me on the photo, mm. and then we are delivering those moments. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Douglas. Uh, Hannah? Yeah. Um, thank you, I'll say that. Um, so, just a couple of questions, if that's okay. So, on your summary here, you mentioned um, that you uh, and the board have written to the levelling up secretary, formally requesting a level four devolution. Uh, has the levelling up secretary replied? Um, and first of all, nice to see you. I understand we might be seeing a little bit more of each other in the coming weeks. I will look forward to it. I will look forward to it. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if the levelling up secretary has replied, so I'm going to look hopefully in the direction of my chief executive who might be able to give me a, a nod or otherwise. Um, in, in specific 
in response, response to the point. level four devolution deal letter that we wrote to the, we have had a letter back from the level the, from the leveling up secretary just outlining the the deal as did um, as did um, uh, the other um, the other combined authorities who were given that level four devolution deal, but that we're in constant contact. So the point is, I just yeah, don't know if we've we had a more recent letter that has supersedes that or adds a detail. Is we all we, we haven't. No. Okay. We've had the announced one, and then we had. And you hear me okay? And then we had an email at the time. Um, so, but no letter as yet. No. And and the letter that we got originally level uh, uh, detailing the leveling up for level four leveling up uh, 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 devolution deal is on um, the leveling up website so if you want to kind of google it you can find it it's out there that's great thank you um, and also um, on buses my favorite topic um, obviously very glad to see um, the approval to proceed with the next step of, step of process um, on Tuesday um, didn't get a huge amount of information from that board meeting um, you're aware, of course, that the, the League of Barnes Council is on record uh, on a number of occasions as being opposed um, to bus fran franchising unless it is free, which I think we all know is, is not going to happen. Um, can you, uh, as he didn't sort of elaborate or change that position uh, you know, at that meeting, can you confirm as to whether you have full support of all of the board members on that or whether this just sort of went through to the next stage and there's still work to be done? Um, so I'm pleased to say that we've got support from right across South Yorkshire for our plans for franchising. Um, I'll let Steve Houghton speak for himself in conversation with you in Barnsley Council, but I'm pleased to say we've got support right across South Yorkshire. Um, and, uh, and I think the reason for that is because what we've been able to do through the work that's been led by um, people in our team um, uh, at pace, and I think it is important to say that we have done this faster than anybody else in the whole of the country. We are progressing through the franchising assessment process quicker than anyone else because we realise how fundamental it is to our communities. I know you've thought that from the start and I appreciate that support um, because we're keen to see that we get there um, swiftly. And I know, for instance, West Yorkshire have taken their decision today. Uh, Tracy was a year ahead of me uh, when she got elected, so we're kind of catching up, we're on our heels, but we're getting there. Um, but the reason why we've been able to kind of move so swiftly is I think because we've done some work to show that this is a net benefit to South Yorkshire in terms of what we'll be able to put back into the bus system um, through what I would describe as revenue rather than profit, but what the bus companies would currently describe of as, as profit. And um, so that money that is currently kind of going into the pockets of uh, Stagecoach and First, and I don't for a moment say that that's illegitimate. I mean, that's what they're there to do. They're private sector companies, but they run those profitable routes, take the profit and then put that into their um, in their own into their own pockets whereas actually what we want to be able to do is get to a place where we can use the revenue from those services and take that and put those into the less profitable services and I think that's where we've been able to demonstrate to all of the kind of stakeholders that that is a net benefit to South Yorkshire and actually everybody can see that that is albeit there are risks there of course there are because once you take on that system there are risks and Steve in particular has been very good at kind of like thinking through those challenges and helping us to work through those problems um, but ultimately I think we've all seen that the net benefit is there significantly for South Yorkshire and that's why we've been able to get people to a place where they're supportive indeed I think now actually relatively keen actually to move forward so I've been really pleased about that support that's good thank you that's really reassuring because I, I know that the process itself has moved quickly but getting to the point where the process started <coughs> is, is where the delays were um, and so you know it, it's been it's been sort of evident to us for a long time that this is the way forward and the, the work that the team have done that we've been getting regular updates on on this committee you know, um, it, it was it was really evident what the way forwards had to be. Um, so I'm really hoping that we, we see that sort of quick pace continuing now, see it back on the agenda board in, it will probably be 12 weeks rather than eight because, you know, busy busy month in May um, and hope that, that that support will continue and maybe Steve will even go on record one day as having changed his mind, who knows? <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just say this, um, I think, uh, we are doing this at pace, but we are doing this properly. And I think there is this always this balance, isn't there? And you'll understand this, this balance to strike between dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and getting there as quick as you can. And in Manchester, while they did everything properly, absolutely, they also kind of had a judicial review which slowed them down. We're trying to avoid that. Can I ask? I mean, I mean, because obviously the the judicial review is what we need to avoid on the bus franchising. And I know you're moving at pace. There's no indication that 
any of the companies, etc., affected will will trigger a judicial review, or is that something that you wouldn't necessarily have any whiskers on? Um, it's a bit like the Spanish Inquisition; you don't necessarily see it coming. So um, I don't I, I don't think so. Is is how I would probably kind of frame it. Um, it is always open to them to make a decision that they want to challenge that legally. I would probably be more optimistic in South Yorkshire, partly because of the size of our market. And you know, do they really want to go to that sort of trouble? They keep on telling us they're not making very much money, um, so therefore, do they want to put themselves to, um, uh, to risk risk it at that, for that sort of kind of return? I, I don't know, and they'll have to speak for themselves. I, I also know that one of the benefits of kind of following Manchester's lead is that Manchester have taken a lot of the risk, and all credit to Andy Burnham for doing that. But they then took that hit because they then had to go through that and kind of fight that battle. Um, and really, frankly, they did that on all our behalf. Um, and so before we get there, I think probably Tracy will be kind of going through that and we'll see where Tracy, what happens in West Yorkshire, just up the road, albeit another bigger market. I would assume we will see kind of Steve uh, Rotherham, I hope, kind of going down that same road. Forgive the bus puns, but like, yeah, um, I think we'll be in a place where we will have an understanding of what that's likely to look like in terms of judicial challenge. I would be surprised, but I would not, you know, it wouldn't blow me over if it did happen. No, yeah, no, I think I, I agree. I, I think that Manchester were up front and, you know, battled through all of the obstacles, as you say, to some extent, for all of the combined authorities. So, you know, with a bit of luck, they, they've sort of gone through the more, more challenging process and that's smoothed the way for everyone else, hopefully. Um, Jeff, next. Yeah, yeah thanks, Chair. Um, it's not, mine's not really a question for the, the Mayor. It's a, a point of information for Councillor Richards about the point she raised in terms of the temperature guides for babies in the rooms. Barnsley Council, through their social housing provider, Burnsley Homes, they do that on our behalf. And it's something that you may want to take up with the social housing providers that you have in your own authorities as well. Just for a point of information, Chair. We, we've been working with the um, the chief exec of the hospital in Barnsley, um, and so we will keep, we'll try and bridge some of those kind of conversations, and hopefully we can get that spread out across South Yorkshire. That sounds like a really good idea. So thank you for that. Ken. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. I'm not going to, and, and thanks for your enthusiasm for the uh, the baby packs. I'm not, we 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 had lots of uh, discussions about whether they would be. Uh, means tested or universal obviously gone down the route of universal and they give a name check to uh, children's lead my colleague council victoria cusworth who's really driven that, driven that through and i'm sure there will be a scrutiny evaluation in, in due in due course as to how it's working and what might be improved and what any lessons will be learned so it's not um what i wanted to just give some feedback on the um uh the the, the tree scheme the tree the tree packs uh i found it very easy to apply for um I'm, I'm not a regular online shopper in any way, <laughs> way, shape, or form, but I actually found the process really easy, and, and they, they delivered them on the day they told me they were going to deliver them, and everything was there. And they even sent us a video on how to dig a hole, uh, which was uh, <laughs> of some use, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I think I've dug it up in a, I mean, my own in the past. But, uh, uh, but we, had, no, we had a fantastic morning with the, with the pack that we got, and we got um, uh, children from the um, local children's nursery because uh, at the end of the day, they're going to see them grow. Probably I'm not going to see them grow, but hopefully, hopefully, they'll, see yeah. them, they, hopefully they'll see them grow in, in, in due course. And uh, quite a number of members of the community. And we actually added some um, additional trees, which were donated by a private landowner from the Woodlands Trust. So we did a bit, bit of mix and match. And uh, I think we might go for it again. But uh, no, your provider is real. real and so and what my experience of it was, uh, so compliments to them. I'm really grateful to it for you saying that thank you we went out yesterday and we kind of officially launched the scheme but i know that's been going on for a number of weeks now so it's really nice to have that personal feedback about how that works and i'll feed that back to the team and let them know what your experience looked like i mean buying trees online is not something i'm regularly engaged in but it seems it seems to have gone down uh, pretty well and i'm very you know confident now that that one million target which is huge you get it you know 1.4 million so target for across the whole of south yorkshire will not be without its challenges it's not always going to be as simple and straightforward as that but I do think it's fundamental to kind of my vision for South Yorkshire going forward that we invest in and natural infrastructure because it's just fundamental. It is absolutely vital that we do that. I just want to ask you about a couple of things. Um, year of active travel, I'd prefer it to be a decade or more of active travel. Um, so you're talking about doing visits, but what actions are you taking to encourage people to permanently 
transfer to active travel and what metrics are you going to use to make sure to see whether this is having any effect and, and is a good use of public money and how are you working and what engagement are you getting with the authorities that would have to implement any schemes that you're looking at? Um, so really good question, thank you for the question. Um, so year of active travel for those that aren't kind of immediately familiar, so um, was launched last year, the idea being it was sort of 12 months of, of focus on um, what I would probably describe more as the soft infrastructure rather than the hard infrastructure of um, active travel. We spend a lot of time talking about footpaths, bridges, road um, improvements, but actually sometimes what we don't talk about is the behaviour change aspects of what we need to do in, around active travel. And so really wanted to try and raise up the agenda and help people to understand um, how they could uh, get more involved in actively travelling. And so we've been working on that with um, Ed Clancy, our brilliant active travel direct, uh, commissioner, and Nicola, the director. They do a load of work now across South Yorkshire. And I was really pleased I went the other day as part of the year of active travel to speak to a whole team. They're up on the second floor of all the officers and staff who work on active travel across the whole of South Yorkshire. And there were a load of them, and they're all in one place for the first time, which I know shouldn't be the case, but was. And so we brought them together for the first time in one place across South Yorkshire to learn from each other. For instance, Doncaster do a brilliant job putting in place active travel routes because they, for instance, take their schemes at risk. So they kind of do the work before they've all got, you know, the I's dotted and the T's crossed on the financial funding. And we were trying to get the other local authorities to understand some of those uh, opportunities, what those challenges look like, of course, and, you know, have that conversation across the piece. And where uh, partners are doing well, we want other people to understand that and learn and listen to them. So kind of getting them all in a room was part of that process. So some of the stuff you will see, absolutely, like I went to Hunter's Bar Infants the other day um, to kind of with Ed and we had a really nice morning kind of helping kids to kind of check their bikes. We have taken in, uh, we're working with ModeShift now and uh, we're working on the points-based system to help kind of people get points. So there's a load of things that we're doing across the system in order to try and get more people to see the benefits of active travel. Some of those are really visible. You know, I go down to Park Run. We're doing every park run across South Yorkshire, which I know has caused some controversy about the fact that is it active travel or is it not active travel? I'm firmly of the belief that it's a way into getting people to be more confident um, about moving physically and moving more. Um, and so I'm doing every park run in South Yorkshire, including... Um, Millhouses Park this Saturday for anybody who wants to come down and join me. You're all very welcome. Um, so <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, so loads of work going in, and we started off in a place where we were trying to work out what would be the best measures for um, uh, how to see if we've succeeded. And it's quite hard in that 12-month period of time. I think in the end it'll probably be more like right to the end of this year because we're having quite a nice time. So I think we'll probably want to do it to the end of this year. So it'll probably be more like 18 months that we end up doing that project for. I think it's quite hard in an 18 month period to genuinely see at a population level an improvement. But I think what we will be able to understand is more about kind of A, what we put into it. So for instance, we will be able to have a list of all the things we've done. So kind of what have we, every part run we've been to, every meeting we've run, every system we've changed or put in place. Um, but as well as that, I hope we'll be able to say we've, uh, some more about confidence levels. So maybe kind of confidence levels and understanding of awareness of active travel and. Um, if you don't mind, maybe we could revisit this at a later date uh, when we've got a bit more insight and I've got a bit of a better understanding of how we're exactly going to do that. But it's part of the conversations that we're having at the moment about kind of the evaluation at the end. Uh, do you have a question about this? Yeah. Yeah, just quickly, I would like to know when Oslo is coming to do Penistone Park Run. Yeah, well, I said I didn't want to do it in February. That was my big, <laughs> that was my big ask. That was my big <laughs> ask. We've done, we've done Lock Park um, uh, and, and Penistone will be, I hope, in summer. That was the intention. I'm doing Millhouses next they, uh, they, this, this Saturday and then. They can be a howling gale yes. across <laughs> Penistone Indeed. Chase Field at any time of year. Well, that is Although true. That, that, is, that, that, is is not, that is not confined to February. True. Perhaps an additional exciting challenge might be to active travel to each park run. So uh, I, I have already. So when I went to Lock Park, for instance, th which was the last one that I, w I, um, uh, I went to and took part in, I because um, I was volunteering at the last one I did in Rotherham, I rode, I cycled there. Um, I cycled to the train. I should be clear. I cycled to the train, got on the train, and cycled <laughs> off at the other end of the train. But I, I actively travelled or used public transport. I think you're absolutely right. Where possible, some of them, even though it starts at 9 a.m., some of them I'm not always going to commit 100% to cycling. But you know, I will do my very best. I, I was just going to add um, that there's now a junior park run at Norfolk Park, so I hope, not that I want you sort of beating ten-year-olds. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only a it kilometre be, and a half, good. I believe, isn't it? Is it only one and a half kilometres? Well, only, it sounds massive to me. 
So, so yeah, so we are trying to find ways to support the junior park runs specifically. I'll go down to the junior park runs. I'm not going to commit to doing Boris Johnson style, like knocking them out of the way um, as I run. Um, but we'll go down and support. We'll take Ed Clancy. He'll take his gold medals and we'll kind of have a nice morning with the kids. But we're also seeing if we can't find a way to support more active and more park runs across South Yorkshire as well, because I think they're brilliant. Uh, they're brilliant things to be able to do. And, um, and we have a great cafe there as well. Yes, indeed. What? Every park run has to be attached to a cafe. That's part of the that's part of the active tra that's part of the park run ethos. Is there has to be a place to gather afterwards. So, yeah, there's always a cafe, which is really really nice. That's the main reason I go down actually. So it, it almost it. sounds like um, when I used to go with my mates to the gym, and there was always a pint afterwards. Which <laughs> to the but uh, moving swiftly on, you're talking about level four devolution. Is because I know you were offered the fire service as part of a devolution deal. Are you now looking at that again or uh, and, and whether that's something you do you are looking to take on in the next five years? So the fire service has never been an active part of the discussions that I've had. I've never sought the fire service to be part of that um, uh, blue lights blue lights that we've taken in. Um, I know are you likely to sort it? Well, I, I've, it? I'm in, I have no current, um, I d this sounds like a politician's answer and I guess to a certain extent, but I have no current ambitions to take on the fire service. Um, I think, you know, right now, given where we are in terms of uh, tram and bus and then the OPCC coming in, I think we probably just have to kind of work out how to eat that elephant. I don't know that it's particularly helpful to kind of start talking about further kind of integration of services. And so uh, I have a good relationship with the fire service. I think they're doing a brilliant job. Um, I know they need kind of absolutely all our support, but I'm, I'm not in a place where I'm saying now that that is something that we want to take on immediately. You are also talking about the home, as England strategic place partnership. Uh, how, will, how, will, how will that affect the level of work? Because you've taken on a lot of work, as you just said. Um, because I think the Homes England partnership is A, a partnership, um, and B, it's about kind of investment into um, uh, communities in South Yorkshire, and that's largely about money and us distributing the money and then working with uh, developers in order to deliver on funding. So it essentially offers us the chance to have a higher intervention rate um, with developers. So Homes England are more able, more capable, more better funded to be able to support those housing developments and the intervention rate that we can offer those developers to take on maybe some of those brownfield sites or difficult developments that otherwise wouldn't happen. And that's why I think it's such a good thing that we've signed that partnership. But also because we already have within our devolution deal a responsibility for the design and supply of housing in South Yorkshire. So it fits very neatly with our, with our current and existing powers. I mean, uh, taking on additional um, uh, uh, powers and indeed additional services and this, that is a very um, clear example of a service delivery role that's a very different thing I think for this organization do you think you've got the, the, enough resources for that that's what I'm saying so, um, with with everything else taken off you think you've got enough resources to adequately give do justice to to that with that partnership to the homes England partnership yeah, or OPC yeah, home, yeah. Uh, so so in terms of the homes England partnership absolutely or that, that said I would always like more resources. <laughs> you will not be surprised to hear me say, I would always like more resources in this organization to be able to do more and have, have more impact. I think what we're increasingly showing, and I hope people agree, but I appreciate not everybody will. I hope everybody would agree. We're, we're actually getting to a point now where I think devolution is really paying dividends in South Yorkshire. We're beginning to be able to show the real benefit of taking back control of some of those services systems and approaches across tram, across bus, things like the baby uh, beds for baby scheme, things like the tree planting. We're having a holistic vision for what we South, want South Yorkshire to be. Today we've announced our growth plan, our skills strategy. We're starting really, I think, to get some um, some momentum in South Yorkshire. I think people are beginning to feel that, not just around tables like this, but across South Yorkshire, across our communities. And I think that what that means is that over time we are going to have to do more because we want to do more and we're showing success. And so quite rightly, I hope government, not least through giving us the OPCC, are seeing us as a, as a partner that they want to work with, somebody that they can have confidence in, um, and that means we need to do more. That will necessitate more resourcing and more capacity, of course, over time. When we take in the OPCC, that's an additional 25 staff. When we bring on board tram, that's an additional 300 staff, I think-ish. Um, so kind of, you know, we're going to need more staff, we're going to need more capacity, we're going to need more resource. Like how we do that is a kind of the, the bit of work that we have to do, but I'm confident that we'll get there. As the, you talk about more resource, uh, do you have any plans over the next five years to um, have a precept for the mayor authority? I, d I don't have any plans, but that's not, so I, d I don't want to be in this position ruling that out, not because I just, I don't have any plans is the honest truth. So I don't want to kind of mislead anyone by saying that 
um, that I, I don't know the answer to that question at this point in time is my honest answer. And obviously we're going into an election. I'm sure that will be a bone of contention throughout the election. Um, but I have no plans to raise a precept at this point. Thank you for that. I don't see any more questions. Oh, well. Sorry, no. Well, I've actually got two, two points, really. Both, both pick up on the things that have been said. Right? I mean, on the point about active travel, um, I think there's a risk of um, being a bit distracted by good things about you know, being active, you know, making use of parks, having fun. So, so park runs, the point is park runs are not active travel. Active travel is how you get to parks or whatever. Um, and, and I think sometimes you know, the point about active travel is it, it's to enable and empower people to sort of get to school and college and work, not just a, a sort of bolt-on hobby thing. Um, you, know, you should be looking at boots and bikes replacing cars to a large extent, obviously not completely, um, but it's not just something that you take out in the boot of your car at a weekend. Um, so that's just a point I'm making. But on the, on the devolution side, I mean, I, I think my point is about, it, it reflects a bit of what I was saying before about the worry that some aspects of devolution are actually greater centralisation, moving functions away from the four districts into, you know, a single centralised combined authority. Um, I mean, what's your view on that sort of criticism of devolution? I recognise that as a challenge. To be fair, I think I think that's I, I don't think that's an unfounded um, concern in any stretch of the imagination. That said, I also think that there are a load more examples that we could point at where working across South Yorkshire through this office, but not necessarily controlled by this office, can pay dividends. And that's the approach that we often try and take. So on the Beds for Baby scheme, as a good example, we put the money in. The local authorities themselves help us with the understanding of what the challenges look like in their individual spaces and who the partners are that we need to bring into that system. Um, and then we work collectively across South Yorkshire to learn from each other. And I think that's a really good example of where this works well. There are certainly examples you could point at where this could work in a way which felt much more like us taking control over something that currently resides with Sheffield Council or any other council. And I'm always conscious of that. And frankly, so are kind of, you know, brilliant chief exec, brilliant leader who are kind of absolutely kind of aware of that too. And we're constantly having these sorts of conversations. But I think that's one of the benefits of the mayoral model uh, that in the way that it's been constructed in South Yorkshire is that we absolutely are a combined authority. So all of those decisions are taken collectively. And you can be, you know, absolutely assured that Tom, Steve, Chris, Roz, if it looks like we're engaged in some sort of land grab for powers, we'll absolutely kind of, you know, whip that straight back off the table. So this is always a kind of, a, a kind of, I think, quite healthy tension, and I would describe it as a healthy tension, and I think that's a good thing. Um, so I'm not inured to it. I think it's a good question, but I, I also think that we've probably got the balance just about right in South Yorkshire. Yeah. Moving on. Okay, just, have you got one more five, question? Five, five just on the specifics of... Okay, yeah. Uh, Specific taxi licensing, where, where are we going on that? That was one of the things in the level four devolution that stands out a bit. So, so there's a very live conversation going on with DLOC at the moment about, about that, and I, I push back a little bit on some of that because I recognise some of the challenges across South Yorkshire. There's clearly kind of issues around uh, uh, taxi licensing across the region, and it's a bone of contention for taxi drivers themselves who not unreasonably say that they want the highest levels of, um, of highest standards in South Yorkshire to be adhered to by everybody that that works here, and I support them in that objective. I think that's absolutely right, and we have some very high standards in South Yorkshire, not least in Rotherham. Barnsley have just announced a scheme to put more funding into uh, cameras. Uh, I know that in Sheffield you've got specific levels of support around the clean air zone, for instance. So, you know, we want to maintain those high standards. At the moment, under the current rules and regulations, we're not able to maintain those high standards because of the cross-border trade. So I'm enthusiastic about trying to solve that problem. I think that problem is probably best solved at a national level to give us the ability to uh, kind of mandate certain standards or to control that uh, around South Yorkshire, a sort of ring around South Yorkshire um, to maintain standards. But it's a live conversation with DLUC, so I'm happy to come back at a later date as and when things develop and, and revisit that question. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Josh? Thank you, Chair. Oliver, I just, uh, I just wanted your opinion on the, the transfer of PCC powers. I just wanted your opinion on the uh, appointment of a deputy mayor to carry out the functions of the PCC. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Something I've covered before in this uh, in this meeting. I, I think we need a deputy mayor to um, to. If you look at the other uh, combined authorities that have taken on this model, so you look at um, Greater Manchester, you look at West Yorkshire, they have taken on a deputy mayor, 
and as a result, I think that person kind of has done a good job. I think if you look at, for instance, Bev Hughes over in Greater Manchester, she did a brilliant job in leading that service. I think if you look at um, Kate Green, she's doing a good job over there. Um, so I think it's the right approach, and I think it's the right model to bring in a deputy mayor, a full-time mayor to deputy mayor to run that service. Thank you. Th thanks. Thanks for that answer, Oliver. I, I'm quite, I was quite surprised by that answer, actually, just just because we, we're looking here in the papers that a response was given that uh, that this is a decision which the elected mayor would take up after taking office. Presumably, that's after May, then after the election in May. Uh, I think the papers are referring to. But it, I, I just I just quickly move on because isn't isn't the isn't the risk with having a deputy mayor to carry out the PCC functions is. You then go from having an elected representative carry out those functions to then a bureaucrat. So how will you ensure that this person who, who will be in charge of the PCC functions is ultimately responsible to you and that when you come to scrutiny committees and you're asked questions on PCC functions, you don't just say to members of this committee, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's the deputy mayor. Yeah, it's, uh, absolutely. Actually, a fair question. So um, the way that that works in that system is that the deputy mayor is responsible to me. The book stops with me. The police and crime commissioner powers are individually um, vested in me if I am indeed the mayor at that point. And I realize there are other people around this table who will have designs on that role. Um, so I am absolutely kind of like um, committed to the fact that as the mayor with those police and crime commissioner powers, the book stops here. Ultimately, though, you need somebody to do that job effectively who is going to be able to focus on that full time. And that means bringing in somebody, somebody who has got the sufficient level of experience, the sufficient level of credibility within that system to be able to lead the changes, lead the day-to-day -day services that you need to see happen. And to a certain extent, that is the way that it works right across the system regardless. So when you look at, for instance, our growth plan, when you look at, for instance, housing, when you look at, for instance, uh, transport, we have people in those roles who take on those roles to lead that service and they are accountable to me and I am accountable to the public. And so I don't think it's a huge departure in that sense, except to say that person is probably a lot more high profile, probably a lot more able to come to a meeting like this and certainly kind of put themselves in front of um, the scrutiny functions of the police in order to be able to answer those questions directly themselves. So yes, I will happily come and speak to this forum and Josh, I will always happily speak to you about kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it, but that person will also be available to the different parts of the system that want to interrogate the work that they're doing. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for your time today and um, make sure you reserve the meetings we have in our diary for next year, um, just in case, obviously. <laughs> Um, and, and, and anybody else around the table yeah. and make sure that uh, anybody else around this table who, who has designs on the posters we say flashes out because they expect them to turn up to the scrutiny committee and obviously we can have a discussion obviously a lot of the police and crime panels will reside with the police and crime panel in their powers but I think any of the logistics on how the commit how you intend to we would rightly have a role at this scrutiny committee to challenge you on what you may be looking forward to doing and any plans or anybody has any plans once that's happened after May. It's been quite rapid anyway. Can I, can I just briefly t touch on that because I think it's important I think it's a really valid point. Um, I, I think one of the b main benefits in my view of bringing the PCC powers into this office is the integration of those powers into those other services and touch points that we are kind of working on not necessarily in control of, but able to kind of coordinate across the system. So when you look at, for instance, um, transport and the way that policing integrates potentially with transport around things like a Vision Zero for South Yorkshire and road deaths, if you look at, for instance, um, uh, uh, harassment on public transport, if you look at antisocial behavior at bus stops or interchanges, that is a good example, I think, of where the integration of those two systems could really pay dividends for the whole of South Yorkshire. And in that sort of space, I think it's absolutely valid for those conversations to take place at this uh, committee. And indeed, if we do have a deputy mayor for policing um, after May, and you know, as I say, I'm hopeful that that will be the case, certainly if I'm the mayor at that point. Um, who that is is another matter entirely, but we're absolutely you know, keen to make sure that that person, if they are in post and I am in post, is kind of available and accessible and scrutinized effectively. So, because I do think that m one of the large major benefits of doing that of doing that work is to be able to better integrate the services and therefore you have a very valid role in scrutinizing it. Thank you very much for your time today and uh, 
enjoy the rest of the day. Well, I hope to see. Things. I hope to see you after May, <laughs> um, <laughs> if only for maybe a pint after park run. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I oh, know, yeah, well, you'll see my son at a park run if you come to England Park. I can tell you, he's one of the volunteers. <laughs> right, moving swiftly on. Um, we're looking at agenda, agenda item nine, because um, we've done gone through some of the forward plan of key decisions at the time of publishing papers in this pack, as they say. Um, I don't think there are any further questions we can usually take at this time. Um, and then obviously on the committee work plan, um, the committee work plan, if you've got anything um, as amended at recent meetings attached in the pack, I'll take that as red. So then we can move on to um, item 11. And uh, we've got Gareth, um, Gareth Sutton. Welcome, Gareth. I'll let you give your time to get to the table. Um, and we're going to have a verbal update, which I hope um, it, um, we can... Uh, we can understand, given we've got no papers, um, on South Yorkshire Airport City. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, I'll just start with an introduction. Um, my name is Gareth Sutton. I'm the Exec Director of Resources and Investment at the MCA. So I'm the Chief Finance Officer, um, but I also look after our assurance functions and, and most of the back office functions. So. Um, I'm just here today to give you a brief update on where we are up to with Doncaster Sheffield Airport, um, and particularly in the context of the, the proposal for a project that is now known as South Yorkshire Airport City. So at the February board, the MCA received um, what we call an outline business case. Um, and that outline business case was for the South Yorkshire Airport City proposal. And it's really just centered on three principal issues. The first is around taking back control of the airport, and that will be done by a, um, a lease agreement with the Peel Group. Um, and then the second stage is to re-establish aviation at Doncaster Sheffield Airport. So first we need to get control, um, we then need to go through the processes to re-establish aviation, and that will include um, identifying and procuring an operator to run this. So this isn't about the public sector running the airport, it's about providing the means for a private sector operator to do so. And then the third bit, which is the really important bit for us, is how we use that airport then as an anchor for growth at the wider Gateway East area. So the outline business case is a stage in a process that will lead to the MCA being presented with a decision as to whether they would like to uh, provide resource to allow this project to proceed. We go from a strategic business case that outlines the strategic rationale for a proposal the outline business case builds upon that, um, ident works upon the, the strategic case, and then outlines things like a commercial case, so what is the commercial rationale, how will you proceed to procure an airport operator, how will you acquire the land that is required, and then you go through the management case that talks about how you will manage things in terms of really important things like governance and how you will make decisions, and then the financial case, so how do you make all this work for a financial model. What the outline business case can't do at this stage is really confirm things like cost. So cost will be subject to commercial negotiations. And that's roughly where we're up to at the moment. So the outline business case was uh, received by the board um, and the board considered it through their usual assurance processes. Those assurance processes are required by government and involve us reviewing the, the business case and using independent assessors to test the assumptions that are made and test the veracity of the findings and the process that has come through to identify a preferred solution. And that preferred solution is for the city of Doncaster to acquire uh, the rights to the land over the airport for a long-term lease, a 125-year lease, but with a break, hopefully, along the way. The outline business case further proposes that an independent um, airport operator is acquired through a procurement process to then run the, the, the operations. And it sets out this really exciting vision where we will put the, um, the airport um, at the center of a sustainable aviation hub. So this isn't simply about reestablishing an airport and running flights to sunny places. This is about using the airport as that anchor for a wider, um, wider growth and putting Doncaster and South Yorkshire at the vanguard 
of the next industrial revolution that will largely be focused on decarbonization technologies and things, really important things like uh, clean green aviation and the government's jet zero aspirations. So we're quite excited about the opportunity around Gateway East where we can attract advanced manufacturing industries. We can locate it within the region. We can ally that to all the translational research strengths that we have just down the road in the Sheffield uh, Rotherham Corridor. We've got people like McLaren, people like uh, Rolls-Royce, and people like Boeing already in the region who are really interested in the future of aviation through lightweight composite materials. And we can use the airport then as the anchor to really grow out Gateway East through um, sustainable aviation activity. So that's the, that's the goal. Um, and that's the real prize. So it's not just about the airport, but the airport as an anchor for that wider opportunity. So the MCA board considered this in February. They agreed um, to allow the business case to proceed to FPC. So we got some useful comments for the independent assessor about how we could improve the business case. That FBC is now being developed um, by Doncaster officers with support from MCA officers. And whilst all this happens, the two really important commercial negotiation um, pieces are happening. So Doncaster are negotiating with the Peel Group for the lease and the terms of that lease. And there is a procurement exercise that is also underway um, that is seeking to identify um, a private operator to come in and run the airport. And you really do need an expert to run the airport. So that's all happening at the moment. There is quite a lot of progress and um, that will be coming uh, through in the, the coming weeks. Um, and we'll be looking to take a decision in the new financial year where the board will receive the, uh, the full business case. That full business case will go through our usual rigor of our assurance processes and then we'll present that to the board, at which point the board will have a decision um, to proceed or otherwise with funding for the project. So um, hopefully that's a succinct summary, but I'm happy to take any questions. Can I ask? I haven't seen a hand raised. Um, have you had any expressions of interest from any independent operators at all? I mean, you don't have to give us a detail or a name or anything, but have you been, because I mean, obviously it's a quite a big undertaking. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, this procurement process has been running for a number of months now. Um, there's been a, a long list that's been whittled down to a short list. That short list is, is where we're currently at with people preparing final bids. Right. Next, next, next question. So I'll bring you in. Um, you're talking about you know advanced technologies, decarbonisation, that sort of thing. I, I know that airports tend to take a life of their own. I mean. Uh, from my uh, long me memory, Stansted was supposed to do a lot of this at one time before the likes of Go and Ryanair and EasyJet came in. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, that was supposed to be that hub that was connecting with the rest of Europe uh, with short haul, you know, short haul flights from city to city. And it ended up being mainly a airport for cheap destinations and sort of that sort of thing. How are you going to protect your nest? You, this is a grand statement you've made, and I want to know how you are going to protect that this might happen that way. Uh, that you, for, for your aspirations, how, how you know, because that will obviously le lessen the commercial value of any. I, I think there are, there are two things at play. So the the first is the uh, commercial sustainability of airport operations generally, and to get to that point, then we do need carriers operating from Doncaster. The, the wider goal is the use of Gateway East, which is the largest single permission site in the United Kingdom, the, the biggest site with planning permission that is ready to go. Um, and how do we make that work? Well, we make it work in part through our existing strengths. So there is a reason why the likes of Boeing are here um, investing into South Yorkshire, and that is the work that is coming out of the universities, particularly around lightweight composite materials, and that's the, that's the future. How do we make that work at the largest single permission site in the UK? Well, part of the answer, but not all of the answer, is through our investment zone, so the UK's first investment zone. <coughs> Gateway East is an opportunity site um, where we um, will have business retention opportunities. 
There is money that comes with this. So we have this amazing opportunity. It's not without risk. None of this ever is. And the running a commercial airport is clearly inherently risky. But the opportunity is that we can join the dots on a number of different things. So we have the opportunity to reestablish aviation. We have existing translational research strengths just down the road. And we have the UK's first investment zone with a box full of tools that we didn't have before. And if you can make all that work, then the opportunity exists to take the, the strengths of our translational research activity, take the existing players who are in the region, allied that to people who want to come to the region like hybrid air vehicles, who are on the cutting edge of doing different things around um, sustainable aviation, use the, the space that is already exists at Gateway East and its permission and then use the airport as the hub to drive it. So that there is lots going on within this space and it'd be inherently very complicated, but we really need to ensure the commercial sustainability of airport operations and that will include carrying people um, around Europe and beyond on commercial packages and private um, use, but also that the wider issue is linked and there are lots of tools available to us to help drive that. So. I'm afraid that might be a wishy-washy answer, um, but it is naturally very difficult and complex. I look forward to the detailed report so that we can build it, because you know you talk about some of the industries. Of, you know, I, I come from the East region. Um, airship Industries at Cardington was on the the next industry, next sustainable industry for month after month, year after year. So we'll see that. But I'm going to pass on to Douglas. Thanks, but. Uh, I mean, it would be helpful to have had a paper on this um, because uh, I'm not sure why it's just a verbal report. Uh, really, my question though is, I mean, it all sounds good, but how much is speculation and how probable is it that any of this is actually going to happen? And I'm going to follow this up by saying, and how do we know that? I, I, I guess that this is all incumbent upon the production of a full business case and conclusion of the commercial negotiations. I mean, we, we are quite keen, obviously, that this happens. Gateway East was a significant employer, significant contributor to gross value add within the region. So everyone is trying their very best to, to make this work. But as with any commercial negotiation, it's in, subject to getting the right deal. And that's what we're all working towards. I'm not doubting that you know, people are working hard on it. It's just, um, you know, it, it's very hard for us to say when it's actually going to happen. It's the, it's a large amount of money going into it. I mean, the bottom line is that um, small airports um, never really make any money. So the question is, who's ultimately going to be paying for this? Um, and how much money does Peel get out of this? Um, so the commission on negotiations for the lease uh, are ongoing and, and clearly if we wouldn't want to put um, commercial information out in the public domain at this point. Um, the, the, there is a, a, a clearly a challenge around running airports within the UK. There is a reason why we are at this point. Uh, yeah. there's, there's, you know, there's no hide in that point. Peel decided this was not a commercial, um, uh, uh, an ongoing viable, viable commercial operation. I guess what, what we have seen and what's been shown through the business case is that other areas can make this work um, and it requires the right relationship between commercial operators, between private airport operators, between carriers um, and a willing public sector who can support in the way that we can around in investment into infrastructure and, and drive in the right levels in, of investment to it. Um, and that's that's the, the challenge, but also the opportunity going forward. So th there is no denying this is an incredibly complex and difficult operation. Um, we cannot guarantee anything. Um, but I think what we are doing is working with partners in Doncaster to really try and give it our best go, um, because it is such a, a, a contribu contributor sorry, to a healthy regional economy. Don't know about healthy. I mean, I'll, I'll not make any further points on it, but obviously. From a climate change and, you know, and health point of view, I'm not sure airports are the way forward. But I mean, I think you know, acknowledge that the, if it's certainly it's going to require you know, some certain amounts of public sector investment. And the question is whether this is going to be a big hole in the ground where a, a lot of um, taxpayers' money goes into. I appreciate that, yeah, people are working hard on it, and 
yes, don't roll the pickles. <coughs> I'm, just, I'm just flagging that up, if you like. <laughs> I look forward to seeing the report from this at some um, near future, because we do need to have some flesh out details for us to be able to truly scrutinise the what's going on, because you know what, there's a lot of aspirations there, a lot of things that may or may not happen, but the, the, this, but we need to know that this has the potential to go bust uh, for this authority if if it goes badly wrong. supporting the work going forward because you know a region without an airport in this day and age is, is, is a really disadvantaged region that you have to hike across to Manchester on a 1930 single carriageway road or go on the M1 northbound and turn left at the so oh, just south of Leeds and a two car packed out train that sometimes is often cancelled uh, to get to the airport, so we go. You know, when you're going the right direction, appreciate the you know the financial risks, and we did. You know, there is a proper risk register about it. But uh, let's let's make sure that you know we the momentum is behind the work. What's going on to get this airport up and running for the benefit of people in South Yorkshire? Thanks, Chair. Um, Gav, can I just ask about the use of game share funding? Um, just a little bit of clarification around that, because it's my understanding that Doncaster ha have essentially sort of pulled forward their entire allocation of game share funding um, in order to, to throw at this project, um, which is an interesting eggs in one basket strategy, but does sort of fit with what the mayor was saying earlier about taking these things at risk. It would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that, though, please. Yeah, sure. So um, I think I've been to committee before um, where we talked about the way in which we determined how we would use game share to to enable local investment strategies and then a, a broader regional investment strategy that we call the, the plan for growth. So there was £138 million made available to deliver in the Doncaster Place Investment Plan. That Place Investment Plan sets out the aspirations of Doncaster and they are clearly not limited just to the airport. There are the, the leaders in Doncaster have significant aspirations for, the, for their place. Um, that came to the uh, sorry to the MCA board last year. It was endorsed by the by the MCA board and obviously um, the South Yorkshire Airport City project was significant within that, that project, uh, within that investment plan. What we have said is that the money that was set aside for the delivery of that plan is available to Doncaster. But what we've never said is that the totality of that money has to be used on this project. So we've been very keen not to put numbers out into the public domain that says we are going to spend this amount of money on this project because clearly there are commercial negotiations ongoing and you never want to show the totality of your hand. So we, we have been clear that the Doncaster Place Investment Plan has a part of money assigned to it um, and that we, we have endorsed that plan. We've received the business case for um, the, the OBC for this individual project. That money that is available for the delivery of Doncaster's Place Plan could be used for this project, subject to the conclusion of the commercial negotiations and the delivery of a full business case. So we daily hope that there will be lots of money left over um, because Doncaster are running really good procurement exercise um, and have lots of capable people working on it in this space. But the firepower is there for Doncaster colleagues to uh, conduct those procurement exercises. So I think that's where the, the number that you're probably referring to as, as being attached to this project, but it's for the totality of Doncaster's um, aspirations and the airport is just one of those. Thank you. Thank you, I think we've, I've got no more questions. Thank you very much for that, uh, Gareth. Thank you for your time today and I uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Right, item, um, Make sure. Uh, item 12, bus franchising. Uh, Pat, a verbal update on, on where we are. I know we've had a bit of, Tim's given us a bit. Thank you, Chair. Um, as is usual, I've prepared a set of slides with, which I'll um, put on screen. Oh, 
all good to go. Just check, these aren't in their packs, are they? They have not been circulated no. as part no. of the pack. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't want to remove me. Sorry, what you're, you're talking about it personally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm shocked, sure then. <laughs> Thank you very Make much. Make us bigger. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Right. I think that was uh, perhaps a little bit better. Yeah, minimise. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, just to give a little bit of context, um, on uh, the 12th of March, our MTA board uh, approved the progression of the franchising assessment plus reform assessment to the next step in the statutory process, which is uh, the independent audit um, that needs to be taking place on the assessment that was undertaken. So a decision was taken following the completion of this draft assessment and it has assessed a range of different bus operating models for the MCA. Uh, first of all, the enhanced partnership as it exists today, which is our reference case. Uh, the second uh, option we've assessed is enhanced partnership plus, and that means um, an, an enhanced, enhanced partnership, so to speak, with greater levels of investment and uh, network, uh, d network uh, change from uh, the commercial bus operator sector and then finally, franchising options. And within that, we had four different variations, which we've previously discussed here. And the variations are different permutations of asset ownership. Do we own the buses? Do we own uh, the depots? How does that work? Um, so what it has concluded is uh, this draft assessment is that the franchising option B with fleet and depot ownership owned by the MCA is the preferred option from uh, achieving our strategic ambitions for the region. Um, so work on the five case business case was started um, by way of a bit of background, oops, apologies, um, after um, the MCA and the former Transport and Environment Board actually approved the initial case for change back in October 2022 and we have continued to work on the franchising assessment um, since uh, going through the formal statutory process as stipulated by the Transport Act and the Bus Services Act. So this is giving you uh, the full suite of board papers is available clearly from our MCA website. Um, so that provides for the deal, but this gives you an overview really of uh, where we got to. So in terms of the case for change, uh, the bus market in South Yorkshire has been experience, uh, experiencing continuous decline um, and that has continued to decline um, ever since certainly I have joined uh, the MCA. And over the past decade, uh, the bus mileage has declined overall by 42% in this market. Also, our demand is declining faster than any other part of uh, the UK. So in 2012-2013, 13% of our mileage was actually supported through the tendered services budget with uh, localised subsidies. And now uh, public funding actually uh, it has seen that grown to 20% 20, 20 actually for this coming, uh, the financial year we're in now is 24%, i.e. a quarter of our network that is essentially supported with public uh, subsidy uh, through the tenant services budget. Um, between 2018 and 2018-2019 uh, and now, today, the, M the amount the MCA is spending on tenant services has trebled, but notwithstanding that, the mileage has still shrunk. That means that every pound we invest is actually buying back less mileage now, in part because of significant levels of inflation, but it just demonstrates that uh, that cycle of decline is very difficult to avert in the current structure. So this is just giving you a slight overview, um, and I'll make sure these are circulated um, after the meeting, an overview as to the decline that we've experienced in the bus network over a period of time. So in terms of bus funding, as I've mentioned, a quarter this year is going to be uh, supported by the MCA, but without actually having control over the network. Um, it is funded by uh, investing a bond of reserves to maintain and stabilise service levels. And the market currently benefits from national government funding as well uh, through uh, BSIP revenue support. But when that support ends, more services are likely to be withdrawn because there's just not enough money to uh, go around to buy back more services um, from uh, the commercial sector. So bus service improvement plan funding uh, has been awarded across um, the UK and transport authorities across the UK. Um, in South Yorkshire, we're getting just over £10 per head of the population of government funding towards buses from that BSIP revenue support. But for example, in West Yorkshire, um, the MCA receives near, nearly £40 a head of the population and other MCAs as Greater Manchester um, roughly get the same amount of money. So we have disproportionate levels of uh, funding available to uh, support uh, our bus network. 
So also bus services have become, become less frequent, um, less reliable and operated by an ever-increasing aging fleet of buses. So in South Yorkshire, our buses are on average 11 and a half years old. Uh, the national average is eight years and the typical life expectancy of a bus is 15 years. So that shows that we <coughs> are on the verge of having to invest, or the commercial sector having to invest a very significant sum of money to get uh, a renewal of that bus fleet uh, going. And okay, investment to renew that aging bus fleet is required uh, to support more reliable services, but also to achieve our net zero ambitions and our climate change emergencies um, that have been called. Um, so this is to reduce pollution and also improve the health of our communities. So significant investment is imminently needed in the bus network. So what has the assessment found is the impact of doing nothing is essentially that the network and pattern of patronage decline will continue. Um, there's a greater level of asset investment needed in the bus network and that has to be funded or is supported somehow. And if supported by the commercial sector, then that will lessen the commercial sustainability of the bus network and will drive a further um, less affordable services leading to further withdrawal. And then we end up in a position do you invest uh, as an MCA or as a public sector or don't you uh, invest and leave that network to decline further? Um, tender services budgets, increased budgets in 24, 25 is, is temporary essentially from local reserves that we've invested. That's a one-off, um, a one-off um, one um, injection also of DFTB SIP funding and that's a one-off level of uh, funding that we have access to now is 11.97 million of uh, DFT grants. And that allows us to stabilize our network where we are today until July 2025. But as I said earlier, it will cost us more continuously to buy less back as a public sector. So fleets, um, we have an aging fleet and it's seen minimal investment over the past decades and we'll see, it's likely to see continued underinvestment without intervention uh, by the public sector. So. Um, you know, we, we've uh, put bids forward uh, through Zebra, for example, for zero emission buses, and that's been uh, a, a relatively uh, significant public investment, really, in the network. So the assessment, so why have we um, started investing uh, alternative bus operating models? Um, the option of bus franchise, uh, franchising within that, clearly South Yorkshire's bus uh, network is, has been in a spiral of decline. Demand is falling, cost is rising, and investment in fleet renewal is needed immediately, and national funding support for the bus market may reduce or end altogether. There's uncertainty around that. Legal limitations also mean that it's not really possible for us as a public sector organization to own uh, our own fleets or directly run services in a deregulated market. So where we buy tender services, we could be at risk of being in competition with the commercial markets and there's regulations and rules around that that prevent us in st stepping in the way we would like to. Um, this position leaves us really with limited choices, really, either leaving the existing market to contract or to spend increasingly limited uh, public funds to maintain vital routes. So the choice of operating model will determine the level of control we have over that investment. So the core of the network is now supported by local funding without control. We have the operating model just determine the level of control we would have over the investment locally made and publicly made. So, if I can get this moved on, yes. Um, so the assessment options, so enhanced partnership, um, we already have that in place, and the MCA does not have strategic control. There's influence clearly through partnership, but there's no strategic control over the network, and it lacks the ability to make changes beyond the paid for tendered services network. So enhanced partnership plus essentially builds on the existing enhanced partnership, but with additional investment and interventions around the network through fares, ticketing, fleet and branding. However, this would still be determined and controlled by the commercial uh, sector and the commercial markets. Um, any network changes would require buy-in from the operators essentially. So it would have to be my mutual agreements uh, with, with the operators. Under franchising, the MCA would have strategic control of almost all of the South Yorkshire bus network and will therefore be ca able to design, specify the network, routes and the service provision, but also the fare structure, prices, ticketing, and performance standards. And it can ensure integration with other modes of transport like active travel, light rail, um, and other, other options that we have at our disposal. 
So this gives a very noisy and busy overview of, um, of the key aspects of the, op of the options really being assessed within, uh, within the franchising assessment. Um, so we have looked at the depot ownership, vehicle ownership, zero emission buses, routes operators and ticketing. And you can see here the blue sections are, uh, the blue letters are essentially where the operator would retain control and where there's Simca ownership or Simca specification control as well. So this gives an overview as to what the different permutations are across those factors in, these, in the assessment. So the benefits of a franchising scheme, um, clearly the assessment has uh, concluded as per the MCA board paper um, and described within that, uh, that a franchising op should be with the assets owned by the MCA is the preferred option. It would give us greater strategic control, as I've mentioned earlier. Um, it would give us also more control of affairs uh, and ticketing and support integration with other modes. Um, also, franchising would allow the MCA to set service quality standards and bus routes and by asking the companies bidding for those franchising and the contracts to contain a specification that has to be achieved uh, through the contract specification. However, franchising, uh, although franchising has got the benefits of control, clearly it requires significant investment and it also comes with financial risks and passenger revenue and transition as is set out in the assessment in detail and has all formed part of the considerations of the assessment. So in terms of the financial case around uh, the preferred option um, and more detail um, is, has been done clearly in the assessment itself, but essentially um, franchising would require 350 million pounds of capital expenditure for fleets, depots and mobilization. And it can be funded from grants, for example, CRSCS2 grants, uh, which were announced recently as part of the Network North announcement for uh, South Yorkshire to get a 1.455 billion allocation of that CRSCS2 funding. Clearly, um, there is um, the sequencing of uh, franchising essentially allows for a revenue s surplus to be generated until about 2040, and that can be kept to actually invest in um, in buses going forward uh, and the renewal of the assets. So that, that money, that surplus to be generated can be retained to be reinvested um, in uh, the network and service changes um, and enhancements. So what we've also found is that Enhanced Partnership Plus is essentially not affordable over the same 30-year <coughs> assessment time window, whereas franchising option B is actually affordable. And please note that franchising and uh, the bus reform and any assessment of the options requires us only to look at those funding streams that are under our control and are known funding streams. So we cannot simply say, oh, there may, might be a CRSCS3 because it's not announced at this stage. So we could not take into, considera into consideration any future capital grant allocations that may, um, may be allocated to the region. So this profile shows um, essentially the financial profile of um, the, the, the annual surplus and deficit. What you'll see on the left uh, graph is uh, that if uh, the surpluses are being retained and are essentially being reinvested when the fleet comes up for renewal again after a 15 year time frame, because this is over a long period of time, then those surpluses can actually be utilized to um, reinvest in that capital asset because we do not know what that future capital, um, asset al capital investment allocation might be to the region. So over uh, the periods from 2024, 25, through to 2049-50, um, franchising shows to have a cumulative surplus uh, for franchising option B. So what is important to note is that there are a number of key next steps um, to be uh, taken. F first and foremost, following um, the, the MCA board have decided that we should take this assessment to an independent audit. And that independent audit is a statutory requirement um, and the definition within that is essentially it, it has to look at have we used robust information, have we relied uh, on accurate um, information, intelligence. So it looks at the robustness of the assessment itself by an independent auditor, um, which we are in the process of procuring. So upon the conclusion of the independent audit, there is a further gateway decision point at that point. Uh, the MCA board will then be invited if the audit concludes successfully and it comes back with a clean bill of health, the board can decide if it wishes to continue with a public consultation. What time scale are you looking at for this now? Because this is where we're at. This is where and, we're at. And you've gone back, there's the options, 
-hmm. So what are you looking at, option A or option D, I would presume? Um, the assessment, uh, the independent audit will look at a complete assessment. Or which, which, which one are you minded to be looking at then, shall we say, without giving any? Uh, the assessment uh, has concluded that franchise option B is the preferred option. B, right, okay. And what's the time scale for this? Um, independent audit, indicative and learning from other MCAs, should take 8 to 12 weeks, give or take. Is that where we're it at? depends on if some uh, if uh, we cannot foresee that. So independent orders will never really say yeah. this is when we will conclude. They will conclude when they have done the assessment properly, um, the, the independent order properly. Yeah. Is it all the right to come to this sort of as in is it those the big four or are there special independent auditors or franchises? Uh, no, there are no particular specialists. There may be auditors out there who have experience from other from other MCAs, um, but yeah, th it's typically it tends to be the big four who are in the frame. But uh, recently they've um, they've alleviated because initially we had a very nar narrow pool of auditors to choose from. But recently the rules, the guidelines have been um, made easier, so we have uh, more organisations to choose from from our procurement frameworks. Not knowing the difficulties that local governments are having. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Knowing the difficulties that local government has with getting their own accounts audited and everything, how interested are the big four? Have they got capacity? Or when you, I know you say the pool is bigger, mm -hmm. but do they actually have capacity to do it? We we sort of say, oh, we want it in eight weeks or something, but they might say, no, oh, it's going to take a lot longer than that because we don't. We can't do it immediately. Yeah. The risk of capacity always exists. Um, we have, of course, tested um, and investigated the market uh, beforehand, so we have got um, we have got confidence that audits can be made available um, to undertake this this independent audit. So there's a reasonable degree of confidence, but until we actually get the bids back um, from the market. Um, we cannot be 100% certain. Yeah. 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 Questions for everybody else on that? Thanks for the update. I, I presume that if we're looking at the capacity, uh, sorry, we're after your time, um, that unless you aren't interested again, we will be looking at this in our meeting in, is it September? We're fine. That would be because there's, there's a July meeting, but that'll come to the board. And then I presume that we would want to be looking at it soon afterwards as part of the scrutiny function. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your briefing. And I think it's on to Tim. It's a, a briefer than we thought because it's more of an interim briefing. Because um, uh, we had an informal briefing on the £2 bus fare initiative. You're setting out the latest research and findings that you've got at your fingertips. I, I, I am in, indeed, Chair, and um, I'll, I'll again try and keep this relatively brief. I appreciate we've got a couple more items on the agenda still to go through. Um, so, really, this, this paper just sets out the latest findings that we have, as you say, at our disposal, particularly in respect of the £2 fare cap. And just to remind members, um, that fare cap was originally implemented back in uh, late 2022 ahead of the national bus fare cap, which came in in January of that year. So. Minor authority at the time implemented both its own fair cap funded from its own funding um, for two months uh, and then that fell back into government in terms of their management and payment of those services for, for the fair cap uh, to direct bus operators. Um, we also implemented our own fair cap on tram at that time and in fact we are the only light rail system in the country to have a fair cap on our light rail so that's positive in that regard. Uh, we have undertaken market research to test both the, you know, the, the benefit and, and general public perception of, of that fair cap being in place. Um, and it's probably fair to say, and you'll certainly see this set out in 1.7 in the, in the paper, that it's been quite a difficult process to navigate, not least because um, the goalposts have changed more than once throughout that time frame, uh, both in terms of um, the duration and extent of the fair cap, which was originally three months, then six months, and I'm still now ongoing. Um, but also the price that the fair cap was meant to operate at. So we made some changes last year in the assumption that the fair cap would rise from £2.50 £2 on the 1st of November. 
had put all in place all of our own arrangements and only for them for government to change their views and retain it at two pound and also extend it further to a, to a further month through to the end of this calendar year. So um, we've tried to manage and navigate that as I say as best we can um, and who knows what happens next. You know, that fair cap may be further extended, may be retained but at an increased fare on the book. We will just have to wait and see. But certainly the findings um, as as the paper sets out um, are, are generally positive, both in terms of the number of trips that it has made, but also in terms of the, the net benefit to fair payers. So under 2.7, you'll see, for example, that um, on a, from a tram basis, um, whilst it has uh, required uh, 2.2 million pounds of reimbursement to, uh, to SuperTram in terms of cost, actually it generated 3.7 million pounds of direct savings from passengers in terms of reduced fare box. Uh, payments uh, made by them. Um, so um, it, uh, you'll see from the graph in 2.82 that it does appear that it's significantly reduced, but actually that's largely presentational because as the fare went up to £2.80, actually one of the fares that was significantly a proportion of the £2 when it was at £2 has now been removed out of that process, and again that's described in 2.7 above, so it, it actually doesn't look as bad as, as perhaps that graph might set out. Um, I'll not go through in detail in terms of kind of the individual benefits, but obviously the range of money that the, uh, that the scheme has saved uh, on an individual, ba individual basis is on average £115 per person at the time at which the research was undertaken as well, so that can be seen as positive, particularly in the context of a cost of living crisis. Um, and also there's evidence, again, described in 2.10 in terms of um, both the, the relative satisfaction of that but but also in terms of the amount of trips it generates so there's a, an increase net increase of four percent relative to a five percent decrease overall in number of bus trips being made by those users who currently use the fare cap um, what, what i would say uh, in amongst all of what i've just described is that clearly there's still need for further levels of awareness of the fare cap amongst bus users and non-users um, so uh, there's definitely a requirement to do further marketing and, and uh, general levels of awareness to be raised of the fair cap of its existence, um, and particularly linked to that also to undertake further market research to get further final evaluation of the scheme nearer towards when we currently assume it's going to be ending at the end of this calendar year. Uh, one final point, and again a recommendation from this paper more generally, and certainly something that I'm strongly encouraging, in fact it's in my business plan for this year, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it, um, is to start work, certainly from the start of this forthcoming financial year, to plan in the event of that fair cap ending both on tram and on bus. So if that fair cap were to fall away in its entirety and cease, all of a sudden people who are currently paying £2 will guess what, suddenly start to be paying quite a bit more. And there has to be a controlled manner in which that transitionary exercise is undertaken in collaboration with government, in collaboration with the bus operators, and certainly debate through the enhanced partnership as well. So what we can't do, I don't think, and unless this um, this uh, members have a different view is just let that happen without any intervention or any kind of controlled um, conversation to take place. So I'll, I'll pause there, Chair, happy to take any questions on the paper. Um, one point of note, we will be bringing back in due course of to a later meeting also the evaluation of the Green Beyond scheme as well, which was not included in this paper for this, uh, for this meeting. And I just say that, you know, make sure you get this strong research because put, put this to the government to make sure to show that the positive impact that it appears to be having and on and potentially as, you know, because people, some of these things take time to um, to feed through that, that, you know, that bus fares and the ability for people to take buses a reasonable rate is, is something that, that can only be lauded actually for you know for all sorts of reasons uh, not as a direct uh, consequence of this research chair but there is general evidence to prove that it typically takes between 12 and 18 months for people to, to behavior change and, and to, to, to you know have recognized benefit in terms of things like fair changes too so these things don't happen overnight um, again very good reason for, for doing this, what you've just described Thank you very much, Tim. Oh. So just, just one thing. Um, I know you, what you say about behaviour change. I was just wondering how much of um, a change this has made on people on uptake of bus usage. Is there any indication that more people are going on buses, because, either because they're relatively more affordable 
or because people at least know what the fare is. The best is two pounds to go anywhere now, isn't it? So I think th 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 there is certainly evidence that the simplicity of the message has encouraged mm -hmm. people to use it in a, for more discretionary trips. Um, I think there is evidence to prove that, again, for those people that are using it, so I think it's in 2.9, it says the net, net increase in bus use amongst those that already opt for the £2 single, so there's a net increase of 4% amongst those users relative to an overall in decrease of 5%. So, uh, kind of in essence, yeah. yes, it is, it is yeah. having that desired, desired effect. The real issue for me is actually, again, it's described elsewhere in the paper, is general levels of awareness amongst the public of this, so those that are particularly non-bus users do not even know this exists. In fact, I was speaking to someone personally recently and they went, I can't believe you know, a friend of mine got a bus from Buxton to Sheffield for £2. Well, of course you can. Why, why wouldn't they? So I think there has to be an exercise in raising general levels of awareness whilst there is a scheme in place. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move on to swiftly to the local nature recovery strategy. And yeah. <coughs> uh, oh, no, that's no, after that, actually. That's 15. That's the one after. That's after. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Right, any, anyway. Um, so we're moving on to later. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I, yeah, just want to get some slides. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I think they're up, great. So, happy to run through this, but obviously, I don't know if any members have any questions at the beginning. Feel free to, to fire them off. Um, so, I guess to kick off, just kind of running through a bit of the background of the strategy, so kind of what this is and where it came from. So, the Local Nature Recovery Strategy, or LNRS, it came through in the Environment Act 2021. So, it's a new duty on... Um, mayoral combined authorities where they exist, like ours, to take this on as a statutory duty. Um, the same piece of legislation brought into power um, by diversity net gain, so that's a, that's a parallel piece of sort of a, a new duty on local authorities, and it's very much in partnership with, it's working with the, the local nature recovery strategy. So I've given a couple of quotes there in DEFRA's words, kind of what this is about. Um, I think it's kind of, it's a mixture really of being evidence-based and kind of drawing upon what we know about the natural environment and the state of it in the region, and trying to identify areas where the improvement or creation of new habitat will have various benefits, partly to biodiversity and species, but also partly to kind of um, to society more broadly. So we can talk about things like um, ecosystem services. It might have um, carbon sequestration, natural flood management, regulating air quality, and so on. So it's partly evidence-based, but I think also very much um, the steer from DEFRA is that we do a lot of stakeholder engagement. So this is not just a you know number crunching exercise, a mapping exercise. It's very much engaging with communities, um, and people where they live, but also kind of experts in the region to draw upon their knowledge, to draw upon their kind of their their views about uh, what priorities should be for nature recovery. Particularly important stakeholder probably is, is going to be farmers um, across the country, and that's also true in, in, in our region as well. I think over 50% of the land in South Yorkshire is farmed in some way. So we are one of 48 strategies in England. They're all happening right now uh, across the country, um, and it's a permanent statutory duty. So we, this is the first iteration of the LNRS, but the plan is that there will be future iterations. We don't know exactly when, but we know that when they are, um, they'll all happen kind of in, in parallel. So we'll all be doing kind of re refresh refreshes to LNRS at the same time. And at the bottom there, there's three things at the, at the statutory sort of duties, the things we need, to, we need to achieve, the deliverables. So I mentioned about agreeing priorities for nature recovery. That's going to happen through the stakeholder engagement process. Um, that will lead on to mapping the most valuable um well, sorry, sh sharing proposals for where nature recovery should happen, and it will be underpinned by mapping the most valuable existing areas for nature. So DEFRA quite keen to quite keen to reinforce this is not a delivery plan, so this is a strategy. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, it's very much tied to some delivery mechanisms already already happening. So I think first and foremost would be biodiversity net gain. 
So local planning authorities have this new duty. It just began in February. Um, and it's a, it's a change in the planning system, which essentially means that as a consequence of any new development, um, we need to prove that, well, we need to achieve a, a net gain in biodiversity. Um, it can happen on site uh, of a development, but it could also happen off site. And the local nature recovery strategy will articulate where the kind of the, uh, the, the principal areas, the, the opportunity areas for nature recovery should be if it's going to be um, delivered off site. So this is our governance model. This was taken past the MCA board in September. Um, and it articulates a number of groups that we that we created. So at the top there is the MCA board. And as I said, this, this very model was kind of taken to them um, in that introductory session. The MCA board will be signing off the strategy ultimately. Um, so it will be published and it's due for publication by March 2025. But we're likely to interact with the MCA board perhaps once or twice between now and then as well, because we'll be going out for public consultation. So we'll be um, taking that to the MCA board before it goes out for that public consultation. Below that, that kind of rung of oversight and management. So the local authorities, um, in their capacity as supporting authorities, so-called, um, are very much embedded with all of these groups. So the steering group is, um, is very much concerned with making sure we're achieving the statutory duties that, that are set out. Um, part, of, part of that is um, understanding how to approve the process, so how local authorities would like to take this through their, their various approval systems. The project team in the middle there, that's kind of that's the MCA and officers, colleagues of mine working on this. The advisory panel on the left there, we appointed recently. We went through a kind of quite a robust appointment process, um, really to try and draw upon the just the advisory panel, who's it made up of? You know, what sort of, have you looked out, who have you reached out to? Yeah, so it's, th the idea was that it was a mix of kind of public, private and third sector representatives. So there's a couple of DEFRA agencies on there. So um, Forestry Commission, for example, um, but also both Wildlife Trust in the region are represented there. So South uh, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and Sheffield and Rotherham. Uh, we've also got a number of um, local businesses, farmers as well. So the idea was that it was kind of balancing out that, you know, uh, both public sector, but also wider expertise and, and, uh, and perspectives. And I think crucially, having that farming voice. Oh, sorry, can I can just look in. Has it been finalized? Would you be able to send around a list of who's on there and where they're representing? It's been finalized, yeah. The panel's been appointed and it's, in, it's on our website. Yeah, great, okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can send a link around, because it'd be useful for us to think, know who we're actually talking about. Can I just ask, does it also have reps in each local authority in, in South Yorkshire from our various ecology teams? So, yeah, every area of South Yorkshire is represented on every single group, and that, that also applies to the advisory panel. So we did make sure there's a bit of a geographical spread, but certainly with, with the steering group, with the working groups I'll get onto in a, in a second, very much it's, it's working with the local authorities, yeah. So yeah, the advisory panel, to go back to that, is really tasked with articulating a vision for nature recovery, so kind of quite high level, high level purpose. Um, and below that is the working groups. So that's very much the local authorities involved in the strategy, so all the local authorities in South Yorkshire. It's also s some other partners. We've got um, both Wildlife Trust involved in, in each working group. We've got the Don Catchment River Trust, the Forestry Commission, as well as the Environment Agency. So I think some kind of delivery partners there as well. Um, what the groups are tasked with, as implied by the, the names, is sort of slightly different different things. And hopefully that is reflects the, the statutory duty placed upon us. So underpinning with the best evidence, of course, that, that's what that group is, um, the evidence group is concerned with, bringing in the right kind of data, um, producing a map, and kind of having, a, having a, a mapping portal that can be adjusted over time to take account of conversations which happen. The engagement group is, um, Again, it's to do with stakeholder engagement. So um, I'll, I'll go on to what that, that group is, is leading on to in, in a moment, but very much how we're gonna listen to other, um, other, other voices as part of this. And finally, the delivery group. So the delivery working group thinking about, you know, once the strategy is published, um, what are our delivery levers and how are we going to, um, how are we going to kind of uh, make this all happen? So a bit of an update um, in terms of what those groups have been up to. So first of all, I think it's the mapping and the data. That's what the evidence group's been doing. Um, 
but I think probably a bigger piece of work is around engagement, and we've just commissioned a consultancy to come and help us with that. So this spring, uh, kind of spilling into summer, we'll be doing a number of different activities. We'll be hosting about 20 different workshops uh, across the region to listen to expert, um, expert advice on what priorities for nature recovery should be. Um, they'll be place-based, so we're looking to have them, you know, host them around the region and give, give every area, you know, a fair, a fair say. We're quite a diverse region, uh, geographically and, and ecologically, because there are, there are five um, separate na national character areas that, that run through South Yorkshire. So we want to make sure we're kind of, you know, we're, we're taking, it, taking account of that while we have these different conversations about different types of habitat. So part of the, the consultancy as well is to provide, provide us with uh, ecological expertise, which we, we, we don't have in-house, um, provide us ongoing advice, um, to do some drafting of the strategy, um, and on the community engagement events as well, that's another aspect of the, the engagement. So it's not only listening to kind of experts in the region, but it's really trying to speak to the general public as well and kind of what do they, what would their priorities be when it came to nature recovery? How do they interact with nature? What do they want to see? What are the, the barriers for them accessing nature perhaps? And we'll be doing a, a public survey as well to kind of pick up where people aren't able to engage uh, face to face. Okay, in terms of timeline and project management, as I said, we are being asked to publish this by March 2025. Um, so the timeline on the screen there, it does take us to, to that date. It does kind of, it takes us there. Um, so you can see the, the work we're doing now in the green, um, uh, the, the biggest kind of green line there between April and July is this stakeholder engagement process that we'll be going through. Um, and finally, we'll be, we'll be drafting the, the output of that during the summer. Um, we, within the steering group, as I mentioned, the, um, one thing we've looked at is how this is going to be approved within the different authorities. So at the minute, we've agreed to a, a light touch process to begin with, um, and then a, a more robust um, cabinet, um, um, cabinet approval process towards the end. So that's the current working model, though we are still having live conversations about um, exactly, uh, exactly the, the sequencing of that and whether that fits in with constitutions. But that certainly is what we'd need to be able to take us to a March publication date, which is not a statutory duty. So we don't have to publish by March 2025 according to the, the duty. Um, but it is the date that DEFRA and Natural England uh, refer to and are encouraging us to, to publish by. I think finally on emerging priorities. So a lot of this will come out in our stakeholder engagement process. But I mentioned we did appoint the advisory panel um, just, just in January, and they met for the first time in February. Some initial interesting priorities are coming out from that meeting. So just that you can see there's three there. Um, so the first one is around future proofing and um, the point around um, uh, ne needing to build in climate resilience as the climate is changing. Um, and thinking about what nature can do for that, so what kind of nature-based solutions can can benefit. So, for example, um, peatland restoration and and you know woodland planting as a way of uh, flood risk, uh, natural flood risk management. Um, but then also on, on the flip side of that, uh, what that means for species which might be uh, struggling. So, um, how do we how do we ensure nature connectivity um, to allow migration, which needs to happen as species will start to move uh, as a result of changing climate. The second point there is around achieving buy-in. So this is really how do people interact with nature and this being something which is done with people, not, not to them, um, listening to what people want um, and connecting to, to where they live. So allowing people to have um, or emphasizing nature um, in places where people live, um, which is accessible, which is you know, um, attractive and so on and, uh, and performing multiple kind of benefits as well. So having benefits for air quality, um, urban cooling, and so on. And finally, the delivery point. So how are we going to how are we going to do all this? Um, we know about some delivery mechanisms, but I think there's an aspiration certainly that a whole range of different stakeholders could, could play a part. Um, everything from the general public right to um, um, to wildlife trust and so on. 
And in terms of in terms of budget and spend, I mentioned that we we've yeah consulted. Sorry, we've contracted a consultant recently. So we had a grant of two hundred and forty one thousand provided to us. So that sum is exclusively for strategy development. So this is not to do with uh, this is not to do with any delivery. Um, and we are we've spent some of that, but we've got a good a good chunk left for what's coming up in the next year. And we would need to spend it before the end of the financial year, um, 24-25. So I think this is the last slide, and this is just the anticipated process. So um, DEFRA are asking us to follow broadly this process, this kind of sequ sequential <coughs> process. We think we've, uh, we've completed step one so far, which is quite a kind of mapping exercise, database exercise. But what's coming next is um, agreeing the priorities for nature recovery, and then starting to map those. Um, and ultimately publishing the strategy. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for Thank that. You. I, the only thing I would say is I think, because we, we are running short of time, is that it would be a good idea to invite members of the committee to some of the workshops so that we could come in along and see how that strategy is developing, I would say, because I think we need to. And thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing for that. I don't think there's any pressing questions I've seen for that. Thank you very much, Laurie. And oh, yeah, just one. I mean, uh, I'll say what I did want to ask is again how it relates to the four local authorities in relation to the planning process, how people in planning teams across the district are grappling with actual BNG requirements at the moment. I, is that integrated in some way, or is it really a standalone piece of work? Until until the LNRS is published, um, local authorities will have, they'll be referring to their own existing strategies where they exist to try and guide opportunities for off-site BNG. Um, once the strategy is published, that will be what they will be what they refer to when they're thinking about where to put um, where to put you know where to create new habitat if they need to do it off-site. So yeah, it's essentially BNG is now in force, so it will be happening. But it won't be until the LNRS is published that, that they're able to actually, you know, use that as. A, um, it, it also has a it has a, a sort of material impact in terms of the biodiversity metric. So I think it's something like an uplift of fifteen percent if they cite um, nature recovery where we've articulated a an opportunity area. Uh, and then just the other thing I want to ask. Them, sorry, conscious time, Tim. Um, just about the, the BNG hierarchy, because um, so, you're talking about you know, offsetting off-site, um, but I think the principles of BNG is that actually you don't do that unless it's absolutely essential, you try and preserve what's on-site. And the question is whether this strategy will help inform as to what's on-site uh, everywhere. So not just the special sites marked out as wildlife sites, whatever, but all sites across South Yorkshire and whether there's going to be um, assistance, if you like, for identifying what could be done on each site um, in order to preserve what's there rather than recreate something new. I don't know if that's, it, it, does that come in within your work, is my question, really? I think it's probably slightly outside the remit. I mean, we are, so one thing, yeah, in, in creating this evidence base, we do have very high resolution mapping, but as high resolution as that is, it always needs to be ground truth. So I, I would say that on a site-specific basis, the mapping, it could indicate what's there, but it would always need to be ground truth. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Laurie. Um, we're going to swiftly move on, sorry, because we're running out of time, but, uh, but the workshops and that would be very good because we can, so we can see how they're operating, yeah. see how the evidence base is developing, because I think this is something where you're not going to have difficulty getting um, a lot of public buy-in and a lot of public engagement, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, moving on to item 15. Sorry, Andy, for keeping you waiting on this. We've already had a lot of discussion with this at the uh, with with Oliver on on this. So if you if you want to um, uh, give us a brief introduction, I'm not sure we're going to have that many extra questions. We may have. Okay. No, that's fine. Thanks, Chair, and I'll be super brief. This is the first scrutiny meeting I've done since 2006 when I was at Doncaster Council, so I'm delighted to, uh, delighted to be back um, uh, in, in this sort of forum. Um, so it's great that Oliver's set it all out, um, uh, the Mayor set it all out. I think uh, it's a programme I've been really proud of. And I'm not, so what I will do is not talk about what it, what it is so much. I will just really briefly 
explain how we got to it because I think it's really important uh, about how we work as a region, as an organization. Um, we came together with, uh, uh, last year, about 60 people in a room and said, there are some things we know we need to tackle in South Yorkshire and health inequalities is one of them. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time admiring the problem and there's lots of groups and organisations doing things like the Integrated Care Partnership and the Integrated Care Board, local health and wellbeing boards and all that sort of stuff. Knowing all that, where might you make an intervention? Um, we spend a lot of time, we did a process called the fishbone, which is in the slide pack, which is effectively a, you put the problem at the head of the page and then you write out every single cause of the problem that anyone can think of. And of course, when you bring different stakeholders into a room, uh, everyone thinks that their cause of the problem is the problem you need to, is, a, is the thing you need to fix, and then you bring to people and they get, and, and then I sit there and go, well, actually, I'd never ever thought of that perspective, and it's a really really interesting way of, of kind of generating consensus on what the problem is you're trying to fix, and then you go through a process of deciding, well, we know uh, income inequality is a real challenge, or we know national government policy is causing this thing to happen, we can't influence that, so let's not spend an enormous and inordinate amount of time trying to fix things we can't fix. Pick some things you can do. So have you got the ability, the authority, or the acceptance? So we did that piece of work with these 60 and narrowed it down to a group of, of, of eight of us who spent a lot more time doing it. We landed on uh, a couple of things. One is trust. We know families, people, communities don't always trust statutory services for a host of reasons. Um, and if you don't trust it, you're not willing to access the support that's available. Uh, and, and even worse, you, you basically stick your head in the sand and, and, and hide away, and that's, uh, that's not good for anyone. Secondly, we also identified there is a problem. There are just too many families in South Yorkshire who cannot, for whatever reason, provide a safe space to sleep for their child, uh, and that was something that the group said we can probably do something about. Um, it might not be pretty. It might not be s fixing the reason why those problems exist, but in the here and now, we're going to fix it, and that's a substantive element of, of the uh, announcement we made earlier this week. Um, but there's no point doing that because in four years' time, we'll come back around and the problem will be as worse, maybe even worse, um, and we'll have to find the money again. So what we also want to do is pick four places in South Yorkshire, one in each um, of the local authority areas, all with very distinct, very di different needs and demographics and understand at a granular basis what are the things causing this particular issue. Uh, and they're the four pilot areas. And then, of course, the third strand, which is the really boring bit that we don't do enough of in, in the public sector, is evaluate it properly. Understand what the impacts are and whether they are measurable and quantifiable um, with a view to that building a business case for saying, the more you invest in this thing here, um, it'll take cost out of the system further up, whether that's fewer people presenting at GPs because of poor sleep or asthma or developmental issues, whatever the issue may be, or even into children's social care because a child who didn't sleep very well ends up having poor behaviour, that spirals, and suddenly the kid's in care. So that the business case we hope to build will enable us to make an investment case to spend more money on prevention uh, and less on tackling the, the symptoms. So we're really proud of it. It's, re it's been a really good piece of work. Uh, I hope it hope it's successful. Jeanette. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask where the uh, pilot is in Sheffield. Gleadless. So that's the geography. Uh, and I, so I cannot remember specifically where there's uh, it's, it's through the family hub um, structure in, in, in Sheffield. Can I bolt in there? Is it actually Gleadless Valley, which is an area of deprivation, or is it Gleadless, which isn't? Gleadless Valley. Yeah. But it is just worth saying, the offer is universal across South Yorkshire. So the pilot areas go in depth. The availability of beds, cots, cribs, Moses baskets are across the piece. Because you're just introducing this, one of the things I would say, because one thing I always say at the screen is, after you've been going for a year, can we have an interim report? So what you think's going, what's going wrong, what could be that sort of thing, because that's 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 when once it's in progress, we you know, I think I think it all seems very positive, etc. But a report back to say these are the issues that we weren't you know when you talk about fish and you know these issues we hadn't anticipated that sort of thing. Yeah, the evaluation. Yeah, brilliant, perfect. Sorry. Sorry, can I just ask a really quick question? Um, it's referral in, isn't 
PEF, uh, which is fine rather than universal. Referral by anyone in particular? It's an excellent question. There are, at the moment, around 100 referral organisations into it's a charity called Baby, Baby Basics. Basics yeah. So they have, a they have a formal relationship with around 100 referral organisations. They are right across the spectrum from GPs to toddler groups to fam um, and there is absolutely no reason for us to broaden that referral mechanism. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, ref the point about referral is that um, you are able to signpost people into other support services if it comes to the referral network. So, um, you know, if it, if it came through to us and we ship a bed to somewhere, um, that's uh, hard to A, manage, and B, we can't wrap in, but the, the referral organisation, whether it's a toddler group, a GP, a community organisation, they have that trusted relationship and can demonstrate they've done something and build on the back of that. So it's via the, the existing Baby Basics referral network. So we're, I guess we're sort of to some extent relying on um, on, on people verbalising this, this, this challenge um, and to some extent, so either specifically asking for that help so that people can refer them or verbalising their challenges to the extent that the relevant professionals pick it pick it up yeah. basically and refer it in. Yeah, that's fine. It, yeah, that's fine. Got a question from Shana, I think. Sorry, following on actually from what Hannah said, um, can we just make sure that all councillors in South Yorkshire are aware of how they can signpost people in their wards to to this opportunity? I I one hundred percent delighted to do it. Yeah, it's it, it it just jumps into my head because of, you know obviously, you know we 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 know, we know where we think the need is, and obviously the pilots are you know are focused on those areas of significant depri deprivation. But you know the community that I represent is is, is Pendleton and Barnsley, which is you know a significantly more affluent and middle class uh, population than, for example, Goldthorpe. But that doesn't mean that there aren't yeah there aren't pockets. And what you know what I find is that the people within that community who are struggling slip through the gaps because we don't have the level of service and the level of support and the level of you know kind of people keeping an eye um on those people um and, and a lot of them sort of look to the outside like everything's absolutely fine and and they're the people that that do slip through the gaps and that struggle to ask for help as well um because that help's not always sort of readily given so yeah it's just i'm just wondering i suppose if if there are any an extra sort of safeguards that it's within this project's gift to to reach out with to um, de-stigmatising, it's, it's, it's de -stigmatizing asking for help for some people who don't look at a glance like they need the help, really. Got it. Sorry, and can I add schools? Because it's teachers who often pick up on these things. Yeah, and I'm speaking to uh, our police and crime commissioner colleagues as well, violence reduction unit. There's, once you lift the bonnet, it's astonishing how. Um, so we, what we have to be careful about is just making that kind of, you know, pick up the phone and we'll, we'll get you a bed. It's, it's, it is never quite as simple as that. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, great, uh, great stuff, it looks like. But um, obviously, just to see how it works in practice, because sometimes these things do, sometimes they don't work. Overall, thank you very much. Right, um, we've got on to agenda item 16. We are going to, uh, with the draft of our committee's annual report, blah, 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 with thanks to all you completing the annual committee survey. Yes. Oh. This report aims to demonstrate how our committee has fulfilled its terms of reference and provided a scrutiny function to the MCA during this year and sets an improvement plan with the aim of improving committee's effectiveness work towards implementation of the scrutiny protocol, which is ongoing. And um, we are getting quite a lot of support, just by the way, from ex other places uh, who have... Uh, other combined authorities that have been developing their scrutiny protocol. So, um, so we're just. That's just um, are there any questions or additions to the report? 
neither, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to say that the sessions in between have been really useful, um, particularly, you know, we only have met officially three times. So actually having those sessions and working towards then the, the, the official sessions has, has been very useful because otherwise it just feels like we don't really know what's going on. Um, I'm, and I'm just going to say that I'm disappointed that uh, our Doncaster colleagues haven't joined us because I think we've actually made quite a good team this year. Or four. Um, and you've not been that bad as Chang, you know, Tim. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I think this this session could feel like a like a real kind of surface skim, mm. if it wasn't for those in between sessions, you know, to give us the sort of you know deep dives and and the background information, so that we don't sit in this two hour session and try and pick apart the details of of everything. And I am really sorry I didn't fill in my survey. It's just because I'm rubbish. And if you've got any specific questions, please just ask me directly. So I'm better at that. I would like to say a public thank you to all the officers who provided reports and given those interim reports because uh, the interim sessions because it has been a real deep dive and thank you to Sarah um, for facilitating those. It's been really really useful and I think that gets we get a lot out of that and a lot of stuff that comes up for it before we actually see it here, which is a bit more of a skim. And I think and I don't know they can't you can't you know that's the, this is the way forward that we. And we, but we try and get much more engagement from all four of the authorities within South Yorkshire, or, or the the four the below the Merrill board, because we do need input from all all the authorities to make this as effective as possible. But I think we have worked quite well as a team across, and the questions we've all brought are different uh, levels of uh, our expertise in the different fields. To ask ask those questions. So thank you very much. Just, and just on that. Just, uh, like that. <laughs> so we've got the recommendations so we take those on board and as this is the final meeting before the elections and there's a always a bit of a churn hope not too much of a churn in some ways because obviously once some continuity in with it with this um and uh, a big thank you to everybody for being involved. Thank you, Steve, for you know for giving all the advice. That's brilliant. <laughs> no, thank